And why are we speaking about that of all times? Why for the first service of the Vesit Church of Verano? Why, why, why the Reformation? Because a lot of folks don't know the Reformation actually took place on Halloween, October 31st, 1517. So there's a lot of things the world has taken from the church, like the rainbow and just right. other things. Yeah. We're taking Halloween back. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Amen. Right. Praise God. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Uh, when we think of October 31st, you know, we think of Halloween and All Hallows' Eve, which is uh, the day before All Saints' Day. And, but Halloween isn't celebrated around the world like it is in the U.S. and Canada. Uh, All Saints' Day is, though. Uh, and for many, it's a you know, day of pumpkins, uh, candy, trick-or-treating. But for others, it's a dark day. But for the church, it is a holy day because it's the day of the Reformation. Uh, it's the 504th anniversary of the Reformation. That's how long ago it was that Martin Luther, he nailed his 95 theses on the door of the Wittenberg Church. And it was a tremendous thing for the church. And we're going to get into it, but let's pray real quick. Yes. Our dear Heavenly Father, we yes. thank you and praise you because you are the King of Kings. Everywhere. Lord God, we can't wait to get into your word and for your word yes. to get into us. Yes. We glorify and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Now, before the Protestant Reformation, there was basically one church. It was the Catholic Church. But they also had the Orthodox Church, and both of them were kind of going head to head. But in Europe, there was one main church, and all the priests spoke Latin. Whereas the Orthodox Church, they were Greek speakers. They were mainly in the East. So when Martin Luther's day, when you challenge the church, you challenge Rome. And that was a very important thing to understand. Now, Martin Luther, he is the key person in the Reformation. Why is he the key person? He's the one that actually started the whole thing. Now, we know as Martin Luther is a minister or a monk or a priest and a great theologian. He was a teacher. But did you know he was actually a lawyer? That was his calling. That was what he went to school for. He came from a very poor family. Uh, nine children in the family. He was the eldest of nine. His father uh, began to get into the oil business. Now we're not talking Texas oil. <laughs> but we're talking oil for lamps and such. And he made a pretty good living. He was able to send Martin Luther to, uh, to school for um, uh, uh, to be a lawyer. It was the Everett University, and that's where he obtained his master's degree. Now, every once in a while, we hear a term called the storm of the century. Mm -hmm. And when we think of the storm of the centuries, we think of Hurricane Katrina. You know, we remember what happened down there in New Orleans. We think of Hurricane Ike. We think of Hurricane Irma. She, my cousin's name Irma. So <laughs> it wiped out Florida. And we also think about the tornadoes. Do you remember in 2011, Joplin, Missouri, an EF5 tornado came down, mile wide, over a mile wide. It ripped through this town, killed 158 people, and over 1,150 were injured. That one tornado caused $2.8 billion in damage. It's the single largest tornado in American history, as far as size and as far as the damage it did. So when we think of storms of the century, we think of those things. But did you know in Germany, they also had the storm of the century back then. And there was a storm that was just brewing right about the time Martin Luther was graduating law school. And this storm, I mean, the skies got dark, winds picked up, lightning bolts were hitting the ground. And Martin Luther, he was walking home when this all came about. And he was scared and he said, God, if you can spare me from this storm, I'll devote my life to serving you in ministry. And he survived. Some accounts say that he was actually hit by lightning. Wow. Uh, but uh, he did survive, and he devoted himself to ministry. Uh, shortly after Martin Luther, he left law school and became a monk in the order of St. Augustine. And that's very uh, interesting that he did that in, Saint Aug for, in the uh, order of St. Augustine. We'll get to that in a minute. Here he studied for the priesthood and devoted himself to prayer, study, and the service of, to his community. He grew in his faith. And as he grew and became a professor, they sent him to Rome on a mission. And when he got there, he was saddened by what he saw. In fact, he was appalled at what he saw. He saw corruption in the priesthood. 
uh, priests taking bribes, uh, different things, uh, priests sinning more than just the, the people of the church. And not only that, the indulgences that were taking place, and we'll get to the indulgences, what they are. But Pope Leo X, he was elected Pope in 1513. Uh, this was before the Reformation. And he wanted to build St. Peter's Basilica. And you're thinking, well, what's St. Peter's Basilica? When you see the pictures of the Vatican, and you see where the Pope is, and he's addressing the people, and you see the uh, St. Peter's Colonnade, that's the Basilica all around there, the church and all that area. He wanted to build that up, but it cost a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So Pope Leo, he thought, you know what? Uh, I've got a way to pay for this. We're going to sell indulgences. Now indulgences, what those were, was it was a way to pay for your sins. So if I accidentally sinned, you know, this, that, and the other, I could say, you know what? I don't want to go to hell, and I don't want to stay in purgatory, as they believed all their life. So I could pay this indulgence to forgive that sin. If I knew a family member that sinned and possibly didn't make it to heaven, I could pay an indulgence fee to get them out of purgatory or uh, out of hell. But they also said you could pay for your sins in advance. That's where they really made the money. Wow. So you got these uh, people, these priests, uh, everyone, they were saying, wow, there's going to be this big party over here. We can, be, we can go into drunkenness. We can go into uh, adultery and fornication. We can do whatever we want as long as we pay that fee ahead of time. We have a paper from the uh, Pope Leo X that says we're free of sin. Wow. So the indulgences continued. Well, Martin Luther from Germany, when he came down, he saw that. Uh, again, he was appalled at what he saw. And he said, this has got to stop. He went back to Germany and he got into the Word of God deeper than he ever had before. He was trying to figure out what did he, what, what he witnessed over in Italy, in Rome. How, how, do, how does he become a priest if that's what's going on? And God drove him to Romans uh, chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. And the words that he read changed his life. Just like that song you were singing early, brother. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, right. because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone that believes, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. I love how the King James puts it. The just shall live by faith. That became the anthem and the vehicle that moved Martin Luther in his heart. Yes. And the reason why I said earlier that it was ironic that he joined the, the order of St. Augustine is St. Augustine in 300 AD in that century, he was battling with law and grace. And it was the same scripture verse he found that set him free and settled in his mind forever. It was by grace we are saved, for the just shall live by faith. So praise God for that. Yes. And this prompted Martin Luther to protest what the church and its, and its corruptness is and the selling the indulgences. So on October 31st, 1517, he took and wrote down 95 complaints, 95 things called the thesis. And he nailed them to the door of the Wittenberg Church. Put them right up there. Now you might be thinking, that is that a bad thing to do? That he nailed them to the church? How sacrilege is that? Is that kind of like the graffiti of today? Spray painting something? No. He was trained in law. And he understood when you had a formal protest, that is how you were instructed to do it. You would put your complaint on the place where you were going to have your protest what you were protesting. So he knew, by law, that's where he should be. And thus the reformation, or the reforming of the church had begun. Soon another man, shortly later, named John Calvin in Switzerland, he got a hold of the reformation and said, you know what, we do need to make change. And he started a movement called Calvinism. And that moved into France, to the uh, southwest. Uh, moved into England and the northwest, and as far as Romania. Calvinism was sweeping Europe. Uh, another man in Scotland named John Knox about the same time, learning of Calvinism and of Martin Luther, he started the Presbyterian Church. There was also another man, not a theologian, 
This man was Henry VIII. And he also broke off from the Catholic Church, but not for theological purposes. See, he was married to Catherine of Aragon. Now, that was his first wife. And the Pope said, you can't divorce her. So he said, okay, we are leaving the Catholic Church. This was 1533. Uh, and in 1534, he started the Anglican Church. He said, now instead of the Pope being the head of the church, the king, I, my myself, I am the head of the church. And to this day, the uh, Anglican Church looks up to the monarchy in England. But as we look to that moment in 1517, every church we have today owes its existence to Martin Luther. Mm -hmm. Whether it be the Baptist church, whether it be Pentecostal churches, whether it be Lutheran churches or Methodist churches, Assembly of God, Church of God, every Protestant church owes its uh, uh, existence to Martin mm -hmm. Luther. What were some of these theses or complaints some of these protests that he was talking about. Here's a couple of them. Uh, in fact, this is the very first one. Thesis number one. When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, Repent, in Matthew 4, 17, He willed that the entire life of the believer be one of repentance. See, what was happening in, in the, the, that day in the Catholic Church, people would repent just like Jesus said. I will repent of drunkenness, but I'm not going to repent of adultery. Mm. Or I'll repent of adultery, but I'm not going to uh, repent of murder. Mm. I'll repent of murder, but I'm not going to repent of swindling. Mm. They, each yeah. one had different categories of their lives that they would repent of. And Martin Luther said, no, that's not the way it is. When you repent, you repent entirely. First thesis number one. Another thesis he wrote, thus those indulgences, uh, those indulgence preachers are an error who say, that a man is absolved from every penalty and is saved by papal indulgences because he knew the word of God. We are saved by the blood of Christ alone. Jesus is a toning work on the cross. If his blood can't save you, nothing in this universe can. No indulgences, no giving, nothing. It's the blood of Christ. Martin Luther knew that because he got into the word of God. Amen. Amen. Another uh, thesis he wrote. They preach only human doctrines who say that as soon as money clinks into the money chest, the soul is, flies out of purgatory. Mm -hmm. So they would have a money chest set up. Not like ours. Ours is holy. <laughs> <laughs> but they would have a money chest. And I do want you to put something in there. But, uh, but they would have a money chest set up that you could pay your indulgences in. And they said, only when they hear that money land inside there wow. will you be free from purgatory. So different than what Jesus taught. Do you remember when Jesus taught about the widow's mite? That's right, yeah. And there was a there was a Pharisee in the air putting money in there saying, Look everyone, look how much I'm giving. I'm giving all my money. Mm -hmm. But he said this widow had just one little mite, mm -hmm. little bitty coin. But it was everything she had, and she put it in there, looking around, wondering, will he even take this? I mean I don't have much to give, but I'm going to give. She puts it in there. Mm. And it makes a little song. Dink. But that sound echoed in heaven. Come on. That sound echoed in heaven. Yes. That sound was a sound that caught Jesus' attention. Mm. Jesus yeah. said, that woman gave more than all of you folks combined because she gave out of her very existence. Amen? Mm. And at this time, the church, it was so far from Christ that it was selling the forgiveness of sins by putting money in a box. Wow. <laughs> Another uh, thesis he wrote was, those who believe that they can be certain of their salvation because they have indulgence letters will be entirely damned together with their teachers. Mm -hmm. On the day of judgment, if you think you can stand before God the Father and say, I have a letter of indulgence, that way I, my sins are forgiven. The Father's going to look over to Christ and say, what do you know about those letters of indulgence? You're going to say they weren't around when I was on the cross. <laughs> no. Mm -hmm. Forgiveness was only by me. You know, when we get to heaven, Jesus, when well, the Father's going to ask Jesus just one question, us one question. He's not going to ask us how much we gave, what ministries we've done, where'd we go, how good we were. 
He's going to ask each and every one of us one to one question. Did you know my son? Mm -hmm. Not did you know about my son? Mm -hmm. Not what you could read in a history book. But did you know my son? Amen. Mm -hmm. That's the only way to the Father is through the Son. Amen. Martin Luther knew that. Mm -hmm. One last one I'll bring up was this. He said, Christians are to be taught that he who gives to the poor or lends to the needy, as Scripture says, does better deeds than he who buys indulgences. Mm -hmm. Martin Luther got it when he read Romans. Mm -hmm. The just shall live by faith. So what can we learn from the Reformation? The first thing we can learn is Martin Luther was prepared. See, he attended law school in 1507. And the Lord said, Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> he attended law school in 1507 prior to becoming a monk. Uh, remember, it was during a heavy thunderstorm that almost killed him that he prayed out to God, Save me and I'll devote my life to you. It was his training as a lawyer that gave him the knowledge how to write these theses and where he should uh, post them and how he should word them. If he wasn't a lawyer, he would have been a hot mess. He might have had passion to do what's right, but he wouldn't have known how to do it. It was his training as a lawyer that helped him do that. It was his training as a monk that taught him theology and taught him how to make theological sound arguments. And that's why it was in the best interest of the church to return to Scripture. That was his argument. He was prepared. You know, when we uh, planted this Vescent campus in Barado, we were prepared first by listening to God. Mm -hmm. Pastor Keith's vision was to reach all corners of Buckeye, including Barado. Grace and I also had a burden for reaching Barado and the Far West Valley before meeting Pastor and attending the Vestit Main Campus. Pastor Keith met with the board and shared his vision. He met with the staff and shared his vision. He then started a core of discovery to discuss the challenges that we might face and ways to overcome them. And it's been a great journey, Pastor. Thank you for that. He formed a committee to adopt a new name for the church, as Buckeye First was an adequate name for multiple locations. Pastor then met with the lead team over s'mores and chili to share his vision. P.S. The chili was awesome. The salsa <laughs> recipe from his brother, top notch. And the time we had around the campfire, it was amazing. It was amazing. Uh, Pastor then went to work with the official name change by equipping the new campus for success. He met with the AZ Ministry Network. He met with uh, Daniel and Marsha, who graciously opened their home to us. And here we are today. There are so many things we did prior to today yeah. that prepared us for this time. Mm -hmm. Martin Luther was prepared. We were prepared. Amen. The second thing was Martin Luther had a clear message. When Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses to the door of the Wittenberg Church, he was clear how the church had strayed from God and from relying on God's word as its final authority. Romans 1, 17 again says, The just shall live by faith. Martin Luther believed that it was only grace, only scripture, and only faith that the church should rely on. This must be the foundation of everything we say and everything we do. Pastor Keith's message was clear as he shared his vision for the Verado campus. He made his vision clear to me months earlier when, uh, when he made sure that we were of one accord as we moved forward. His vision was and is one church, one vision, multiple campuses. Yeah. And we're going to make sure that happens because we're going to be united with him in that vision. Matthew 9, 37 and 38 says this, Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful. But the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Pastor, we are here with you Praise in the harvest Lord. field. Amen. Grace and I, we are here. But not only are we here, not only is Pastor Keith and Pastor Stephanie here, 
Grace and I are here as well. But each one of you are here. You are working in the harvest field for Jesus Christ. Everyone here today is answering that call. Anyone who has prayed for us along the way is answering that call. Anyone who's ever given us a word of encouragement is answering that call with us. Anyone who's ever given their time is answering that call. Anyone who's opened up their home to us, Daniel Marsha, you are answering that call. Anyone who says, I want to be a part of the Barato campus is answering that call. It will take a lot of work and a lot of individual workers in God's harvest field to see the harvest. Amen. Will you be one of those harvest workers today? Amen. A third thing we can learn from the Reformation was Martin Luther knew the timing was right. There were other Reformations before Martin Luther, but none of them caught fire like his did in 1517. One of the reasons for this was the invention of, invention of the printing press in Germany in 1440 by Johannes Gutenberg. Mm -hmm. The very first thing printed on that printing press was the Bible, known as the Gutenberg Bible. Soon the Bible was printed into other languages, and more and more people learned to read. Their knowledge of God's Word increased, and the Protestant movement took off. Before this Bible... In Europe, the only people that had a copy of Scripture were the local priests, and it was in Latin. Nobody in town could read it. They had to take the priest's word what was said. But after the invention of the printing press, the Word of God was being translated into many languages. Germany first. If Martin Luther was born in the 1200s or 1300s, think about this for a moment. It would have been so difficult for him to spread God's Word and to call the church to repentance. Because the Bible is their final authority. His timing was excellent. His timing was excellent just like Jesus' timing. Did you know if Jesus would have came before Rome took over Greece, the gospel wouldn't have spread like it did? The Romans built roads everywhere they went. Every city they conquered, there was roads, there was outposts, there was a, a safety, a journey. Before you would travel these roads, you could be mugged any time. But there were soldiers posted along these roads every time. Therefore, the disciples could travel freely. Jesus' timing was perfect. Our timing is perfect. You may say, Pastor Oliver, how can you think that your timing is perfect? How can you know the future like that? I'm going to tell you why I believe our timing is perfect. God has allowed six AG ministers to attend the Vesset main campus, yeah, yeah, yeah. most of which are ordained or in the process of being ordained. And we have a few other godly ministers there as well. Amen. Each of us have a heart for the lost. Amen. Each of us have a heart for the hurting. Mm. Each of us want to see souls saved. Each of us want the Holy Spirit to burn within our hearts yeah. as we Amen. seek God's will. Amen. Each of us hunger for God's mm. presence. Each of us wants to see God do miracles in our church and city. Each of us are on board with Pastor Keith's vision to reach Buckeye in the West Valley. The second reason I believe that uh, uh, our timing is excellent is because of the social, physical, and economic status of our world right now. Right. It's hurting. We've been going through and are still in the middle of a worldwide pandemic. Our nation is so politically divided right now. Right. Where we're in a time where so many people are struggling to make ends meet. We're in a time where hundreds of ships are anchored off our coast. But the supply chain is disrupted because they can't come to port. And I'm going to tell you, this is not a word of prophecy. This is just understanding how it works. If those ships cannot come to port, the countries that sent those ships, their economic uh, 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 economy for their countries is going to tank. Mm -hmm. And if just one of those countries tank, it's going to be a domino effect around the world. If those ships can't come to port, our country is going to take because stores won't have products to sell things. We are in a time where we don't understand the economy is a very fragile thing. Wow. You know, we've taken for granted many times our economy, 
But our economy is a very fragile thing, and it's going to take a miracle of God to change things. We are living in a time of social unrest. Social unrest is sweeping our nation. We are living in a day when people are teaching our children ungodly things about sexuality and are causing many of them to question the way God made them. We are living in a day when suicides are up, as well as drug overdoses. Brothers and sisters, we need Jesus. Amen. We need Amen. Jesus today. Amen. Amen. The gospel Amen. is needed today. The gospel Amen. is needed at our main campus today. The gospel is needed in Verado today. And we have the message within our hearts. Each one of us is a living epistle. We can walk out of these doors and share the gospel by our life, by our words, by our deeds and actions. Brothers and sisters, the call of God is here today. We have the opportunity to reach our world for the gospel, and we must do it. Romans 8, 38 and 39 says this, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Martin Luther, his simple act of faith changed the world. Our simple act of faith today will change the world as well. Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for this time before you. Yes. We praise you because you are the King of Kings, Amen. the Lord of Lords, and God of Gods. Amen. We pray that as that fire burned in the hearts of the Europeans and of the world in 1517, that in 2021, 2022, a fire will sweep at the main campus of Vesey over there in Buckeye, Lord God, and that you will add many, many souls and families to that church, Lord God. Lord God, that you'll do the same thing here, Lord God, that you'll provide for us the help we need, that we can go and spread the gospel to a hurting world. Lord God, we're in a world that's hurting in many ways. Nothing, nothing is going to be able to save them except your love. And Lord God, we have that message. Just as Martin Luther had that message, he just live by faith, we will go forward in faith. As all heads bowed, all eyes closed. I know everyone in here, I know all of you have a personal relationship with Christ. But for those that may listen to this video in the future, um, if uh, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, I would love for you to ask the Lord Christ into your heart today. Yes, yes, yes. And you can do that simply by repeating a little prayer as simple as this. Dear Heavenly Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. Like the prodigal son said, I'm no, worthy, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But forgive my sins, Lord God. Make me new. Come live within my heart. I repent of my sins, meaning I'm turning away from them with all the strength I have. But make me your child. Become my Lord. A prayer as simple as that will start that relationship with Jesus Christ. You'll be born again, and your life will never be the same. Pray that prayer in faith. And for you folks here, I just want to pray a blessing over you because you mean the world to me. If I could ask anyone to be here on this first night, it's you guys, and I just thank you for that. Lord God, I pray a blessing over everyone here, that you bless them forever. Lord God, that you will bless them financially, that you will bless them in their health, that you will bless them in their spirit, Lord God. If they got family members that don't know you as Lord and Savior, that they will come to know you as Lord and Savior. If they got prayer requests, Lord God, that they feel they're just not going past the ceiling, I pray, Lord God, that those prayers will be answered today, Lord God. I pray blessings upon each one here. In Jesus' glorious name, amen, amen. and amen.